I think it's really hard to uh, um, uh, go into an event and, and not have uh, decided, oh, I'm going to do you know, resilience, build resilience after the event. And I think that creating pre-disaster plans, right, is uh, uh, that, that weave together the different ways that we uh, govern, you know, how communities are designed and built. And I think there's some good examples out there. To, you know, part, I think a good one here, Norfolk's gonna, even, uh, Norfolk's gonna be ready, okay? I think more so than, they're what, uh, more so than other communities. I think this is a good case, so I'm gonna give a shout out. They should be encouraged. They should be, be given a break maybe on the flood insurance premiums. They should be given a break when they invest in uh, structural protection, okay, like a levee or a seawall. There, sh there should be some uh, encouragement because we tend to, I'm in the land of where the taxpayers keep paying 25% of all the flood insurance money payouts are going to 1% of the properties. It's because they keep rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding over the last decade, rebuilding in the same way. And uh, there's very little in Texas, I'm independent, I'm gonna do it on my own, and, uh, but, but there is a, a responsibility, I think, and there's a cost to the taxpayers at large. Yeah. Uh, I wish the Norfolk planner was here. She could give you a much better uh, fine-grained answer, but they did go through um, a, a, a process, a stakeholder process, and they had very good uh, visuals. They just didn't have a public hearing at night where people come to City Hall or whatever. They went into the neighborhoods. They went to the, and they went over a 24-month period of deep engagement across. And that um, uh, I think Norfolk is more primed maybe because people are ready to do something different, like I think Houston is now. Um, and, and because of that regular flooding in the city, you know, it's just constantly occurring. So some of these places, the neighborhoods, like the yellow area neighborhoods, I think are, um, are gonna be, uh, they need special treatment and a, and a long range retreat. I think building codes are good, are fine, but when you're in a sea level rise prone area and we're building, making investments now, you know, are we gonna be living in stilts and on, to on top of you know, water? Um, uh, I think the land use question needs to be thought about a bit more. I have stayed another day to be with FEMA tomorrow because they are interested. And we're exploring how we might integrate some of this thinking like in the community rating system. Um, if you're actually applying the uh, uh, looking at the network of plans and so on. So uh, we've been doing uh, in, in the Hurricane Harvey impact zone, particularly in the low capacity communities, there are uh, it's, they're, they, places like LaGrange, Texas or League City, probably haven't heard of these, maybe if you've been to the Houston area, but they want to recover in a holistic way. They want to build back better. They had issues before going in, not just vulnerability issues, but other issues. And uh, you know, in terms of maybe uh, lack of parks or lack of uh, stormwater drainage problems, these kinds of things, they want to resolve these issues as they rebuild. Because I think, like the previous speaker saying, there's an infusion of money coming in. But um, uh, so we're we're actually working in two communities now, those two, and we're trying to figure out a way to spread it out. You can give seminars and these kinds of things, but we think it's very important that they self-evaluate. We don't go in and provide them the information. We try to, we, 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 you can, if you have GIS, you can use it. If you're LaGrange, a city of 5,000, you don't have GIS, you still can use the approach that we've taken. I know there are a lot of scorecards out there. I'm trying to get it. But we're trying to, it's a, it's a practical and working it through, I think that we've, we've, we're finding some success. And uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, that's our next step anyway. And, and thank you to the Association of Floodplain Managers, too. They've been very, very helpful. Yeah. I'm still kind of new to Texas, but I've been learning that they don't like to be told what to do, you know, the state agencies. 
Um, and I'm coming from North Carolina, University of North Carolina, but um, um, I think, uh, though, I, 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 that FEMA could be the center point to get all the, you know, you have HUD now, which is the CBDG block grants, which have to deliver to 50%, I guess, you know, low income, I don't guess, I know, you know, no. But there's a great leverage for maybe disadvantaged communities, okay? Not, not do a recovery just based on, you know, it should be coordinated with FEMA to get the mitigation right with the recovery of maybe low income areas. You have uh, DOT come in, you have um, Fish and Wildlife come in, you have the, you know, there's so many different agencies pouring money in on the Texas coast right now. I, I, I and it, so much of it's federal that I wish we could, uh, you know, they're, FEMA's in a prime position to get that going. At the local level, there's a bit of a struggle too. Sometimes the private nonprofits go in and with, you know, well-intentioned, but sometimes you get inconsistent, you know, with the broader, um, you know, inconsistent investments between where you're gonna run water and sewer and where you're gonna put housing and these kinds of things. So, particularly low-income neighborhoods. So.